What if I told you that we have a vaccine that can save lives, but we're just not using it? A vaccine to prevent this and this. These refugees, they wouldn't have to flee. This mother, she wouldn't be crying. And these homes, we wouldn't have to rebuild them. Now, it may seem impossible, but think of all the progress we've made as a human race. We live longer than ever before. In the last 30 years, we've decreased poverty by 75%. Just 50 years ago, the majority of the world was illiterate. Now, 90% of people under 25 can read and write. But where on earth don't we see this progress? In places affected by war. I've seen violence start and stop. I've seen it prevented and lives saved. For the last 20 years, across dozens of countries, I've seen a vaccine to end war. Now, I got my first glimpse of this 30 years ago, when I'd learned about apartheid in South Africa, that the legalization of that ideology which put whites as superior to blacks, there was nothing else I wanted to do than help to bring it down. So I became an activist while I was at Stanford University, and a few weeks after graduating, I was on a plane to go and volunteer at an anti-apartheid newspaper. Now, when I, when I arrived there, I first lived with whites in town. And during the day, I'd go into the black townships and come back. But it felt wrong. I mean, how could I be complying with the very system of apartheid I was there to fight? So I decided I'm going to live in the black township. Now, this was unheard of, and many people, blacks and whites, told me, crazy idea, stupid, you're going to get raped and killed. But the minute I moved there, everything changed. When I would wake up in the morning and I would walk out of my door, people would run out of their homes, they'd call their friends. I, call, I caused major traffic accidents. And by the time I actually got on the train, well, it was a town hall meeting with everybody discussing who I was and what I was doing there. But over time, people came to see me as their sister, who would come closer on their terms. I learned Zulu. I took the Zulu name Nomfundo, which means someone who's come to learn. And I even built my own shack. It was a human act, but a political statement. And yes, there were risks, but the closer I came, the safer I felt. So while I was exposing apartheid hit squads, during, hit squads during the day as a journalist, I often felt that those train rides back and forth, that was where real change was happening. We were poking a hole in the present and getting a glimpse of what a future could look like that otherwise had been unimaginable. And those years leading up to the 1994 election of Nelson Mandela, they were scary times. There was a lot of violence, and many people predicted the country would spiral into a bloodbath. But skilled negotiators like Cyril Ramaphosa and Rolf Mayer, they helped people to see beyond the winning and the losing at the ballot box towards a future with a place for all. They built a path of trust and they said, come, this is the path for heroes, walk with us. So in South Africa, I learned three key things about how to end war. Firstly, about courage. Not the courage to fight, but the courage to connect and to get closer. That's where all change starts. Secondly, about asking why. You know, I met so many people who had done horrible things in South Africa, but when I asked them why, they told me they thought it was the right thing to do. They were scared. They thought they had no choice. So having the empathy to really understand that why, that's the second step. And thirdly, if we want to prevent war, we need for people to change but they won't when they're afraid or they feel humiliated. So making it okay for people to change, that's critical if we want to end war. So with these three things in mind, I felt called to head up to the Great Lakes region of Central Africa. Because in that same month of April 1994, when we'd been electing Nelson Mandela as president in South Africa, one million Rwandans were being slaughtered in the genocide. Hundreds of thousands more were being killed in Burundi, and a few years later, the deadliest war since World War II would unfold in the neighboring Democratic Republic of Congo. 
I joined Search for Common Ground, the world's largest peace-building organization. And everyone I worked with and came to know had suffered during those cycles of violence. They were orphans, they'd lost their family members, they'd had to flee and lose everything. And yet every day, they showed up with the courage, the determination to bridge those dividing lines, even if it meant risks. So today I want to tell you about two of them from the Democratic Republic of Congo, Innocent and Rigobert. Rigobert was a fiery student activist, and he was leading violent demonstrations against Rwanda's involvement in the Congo War. He had bold steps, a bit of a stoic gaze, and he had this way of speaking in complete sentences as though he'd practiced ahead of time for our conversation. Innocent was Munya Mulenge, that tribe of people whose ancestors had come from Rwanda. And just like the Japanese Americans during World War II, his very identity meant that he was accused of treason. Now, he'd he was tall and lanky, and uh, he could ha hardly hold his grin back. And he'd grown up herding cows, but when the war started, his younger brother was snatched from their house and never seen again. And Innocent's father was heartbroken and wanted someone to blame. Blaming was easy. In fact, people who called for revenge, they were heroes. What was harder was to talk, because you could be seen as a collaborator. So my organization managed to find a discreet way for Innocent and Rigobert to get together for a conversation. And what happened there was a breakthrough. They shouted accusations, they asked why they and all of their group members had done certain things. And then like the skin of an onion, they began to peel off the stereotypes and prejudices that they'd been taught to believe about the other. Underneath, they found a shared passion, a passion to fight not as enemies, but as allies for peace. So we knew this needed to spread. So we rented a bus, and off they went to the, some of the most polarized parts of Eastern Congo. We soon learned that one of the greatest trust-building activities was pushing a bus out of the mud on the Congolese roads. But when they went from village to village, people either wanted to kill Innocent or kill Rigobert. They saved each other's lives multiple times. And they said, no, that's not what we're doing here. Here, we dialogue. This is the place for heroes. Come and join us. That relationship grew into peace agreements, into initiatives to help refugees return, and into community radio stations. People who had been on a pathway to violence changed course. Now, I've continued to work at Search for Common Ground for the last 19 years because I've seen this change happen all the time from Congo to Nigeria, from Tunisia to Yemen, from Sri Lanka to Indonesia. Not just with civil society activists, but with heads of radio and television stations, with army generals, even elected leaders. And in fact, I began to see a pattern. What we were calling peace building wasn't just a set of ad hoc activities, but a science, a proven method to make violence no longer an option a vaccine to end war. Now, when you go for a checkup, you'll find that your doctor is going to take your temperature and take your blood pressure. And we peace builders, we're also kind of like doctors, uh, but we look at different things. We look at relationships, inclusion, trust, justice, and dignity. And by we, I don't mean a bunch of Westerners parachuting in. No, nope, I mean peace builders from those very communities. And we're able to notice things like, why is the media only in one language? Or how come that community can't access land? Or gosh, look at this narrative that's being passed down from generation to generation, scapegoating one community. Or look, crimes aren't being solved. Why? Because the police and the youth don't trust each other. So once we do that diagnosis, we know what to do. Have the courage to connect, the empathy to ask why, and make it okay for people to change. And we also know what it looks like when that treatment is, uh, is, is taking place. We can see levels of trust grow. We can see collaboration replicating and people tackling problems as allies, not as enemies. In Kenya, Al-Shabaab was using the waters alongside Lamu Island to undertake attacks into Kenya. The Kenyan government was afraid 
and they felt that they couldn't control the security of, that, of those waters. So they banned night fishing. And this, uh, um, this harmed the livelihood, this destroyed the livelihood of thousands of fishermen. And many of those fishermen said, why don't I also just join Al-Shabaab? Maybe right now, in front of me, violence is a justifiable choice. So we organized months and months of dialogue and roundtables with the fishermen, the communities, the government, the security forces. Together, we came up with an idea for a biometric ID card that would enable, to enable us to know who was out on, on, at sea and who was at land. The trust built and the fishermen no longer saw violence as an option. The vaccine worked. In Tunisia, after the Arab Spring uh, brought down Ben Ali, we diagnosed a risk. If adversarial street demonstrations were the only way that young people could continue to participate in change, there was a risk of violence. So for years, we strengthened the capacity of young people. We helped them build local organizations to be able to collaborate with the government. And last year, we popularized the idea with a reality TV show called I Am the President, where young people ran for president, but winning meant collaborating, not advocating violence. The vaccine is working. In Indonesia, the government was able to arrest and convict hundreds of people that had been involved in violent extremism. But did that mean that they would never choose violence again? Now all of the high security prison officials have been trained to deal with conflict without violence. And they're engaging these inmates in that rehabilitation process. And when they step out on parole, they're welcomed by community organizations working together with government, welcoming them into the community with connection and compassion. The vaccine is working. And this vaccine does work on violent extremists. This is Arno Michaelis, who founded what would become the largest white power skinhead organization in the world. And he said that the only thing that helped him to change was when the very people he claimed to hate had the courage to reach out to him. He told me that when these people used the weapon of compassion, they were able to make the fear that he felt unfounded. And when that fear was able to, di di to disappear, so did the hatred which justified the violence. The vaccine worked. So I'm doing this TED Talk today because I want this vaccine to spread. But I know that vaccines have faced a lot of resistance over the last few hundred years. In 1794, the inventor of the smallpox vaccine used pus from cowpox from cows to actually create that vaccine. And even though it was scientifically proven, his efforts were mocked. And 300 million more people would die until the smallpox vaccine was mainstreamed and the disease was eradicated nearly 200 years later. So are we going to wait for another 300 million people to die before we adopt this vaccine to end war? Are we going to keep using this bullets and band-aids approach to tackling conflict, spending more and more money training and equipping people to fight war instead of prevent war, while the numbers of refugees skyrocket? It feels to me like an experiment that we keep repeating, expecting a different outcome. So two years ago, I became the stepmother of four kids. And before I came here, I asked Amina, who's now 12, what she says when people ask her what I do. You stop people from fighting, she said. But am I? Are we? And what's really holding us back? I mean, is it that we don't have enough money? Well, let's take a look at what we spend our money on. The US has spent $6.3 trillion on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Seven out of 10 cents of the US discretionary budget goes to fighting wars. One drone strike costs $1.4 million, and one day in 2017, when 59 missiles were launched in Syria, it cost $62 million. That's more than the annual budget of my organization. And in fact, the annual budget of the US Department of Defense could keep the kind of work that I've been telling you all about today alive for 15,000 years. 
Is it that we think if we invest in this that it's not worth it? Well, the World Bank recently put out a report that said that we could save $70 billion a year if we invested in prevention, because every dollar that's spent on prevention saves $16 in return. And some people will tell us that war is natural, but we know that's not true, because so many people that we send out to war come back broken, with suicide rates amongst veterans twice as high as that of ordinary people. In fact, since 2001, 45,000 veterans and active servicemen have taken their own lives, five times more than those ha that have died on the battlefield. So what am I asking you today? Try this vaccine in your own life. Find the courage to connect, the empathy to ask why, and make it okay to change. But I'll warn you, this is not easy. It's scary, it hurts, and you may well lose something. But what, think of what you might gain, because there's nothing more rewarding than turning an enemy into an ally. But if you and I are the only ones taking this vaccine, it won't be enough. We need to invest in this and we need to tell our leaders and, and elected officials that war isn't working. I don't want to have to look at Amina and say that we knew how to prevent war and we didn't do it. It'd be like she coming to me and say, wait, you had a vaccine for this disease and you didn't give it to me? I don't ever want to be asked that question. Do you? Thank you.